From the battlefield in Vietnam as a platoon commander, to the field of dreams of Major League Baseball after Harvard Law School, and a World Series ring as the general manager of the Oakland A's, Sandy Alderson has been leading from the front throughout his entire career in law, baseball, and social responsibility. As part of the Marines Memorial Association's tradition of honoring commitment and sharing timeless leadership lessons learned in all walks of life, the conversation continues in this online extension of what normally takes place at the Marines Memorial Club in downtown San Francisco, a nonprofit 12-story hotel, theater, restaurant, and event space serving generations past and generations to come for nearly 75 years and counting. I'm correspondent Mike Saray, and this is Leading from the Front. Sandy, welcome back to the Marines Memorial Club. The last time I saw you, you were leading from the front here at the Marines Memorial Club uh, in a midnight fire drill. You were going down the, 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 the stairwell from between, I think, the seventh and the fifth floor. <laughs> you remember that? I think I was leading from the front because I was running faster than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, the leadership lessons you've learned from your very storied career from an infantry platoon commander to a corporate lawyer to a baseball executive, and especially the latter, since you admit that you didn't know much about baseball when you got into it. Yeah, uh, baseball was a challenge from the get-go, uh, largely because I really didn't have any experience in the game or in the business uh, before I got involved. But uh, it, was a, it was a quick education and um, uh, some challenges along the way, I think, provided uh, some insight early on. Um, you know, in terms of leadership, um, what I've always thought is that leadership is a combination of, of competence and character. Professional competence in the sense that, okay, you've been, you've been given a job and uh, are you competent enough to actually carry it out? You know, a professional competence. But personal qualities end up being just as important, uh, certainly in the long term. And a lot of that um, uh, revolved around the Marine Corps. There's no question. And uh, so, through that training, through that exposure to the Marine Corps as an institution. I think during my early days as a baseball executive, uh, I was really relying more on my personal uh, qualities, such as they were, uh, as opposed to professional competence. Flashing back to when you were a second lieutenant taking over a platoon in Vietnam, uh, and you didn't have much experience there, really not much field experience, um, what did you do to kind of buy time to get that knowledge curve going for you in baseball to you, so you had some level of confidence? In, you know, in any leadership situation, and certainly in that one, um, you have to be yourself. You have to bring with you what you've experienced, what you've learned, and a certain amount of your own personality. Um, I've always thought that the best leaders are the ones that are most authentic, and their, their authenticity is a result of who they are and not trying to be somebody that they aren't. And so, uh, you know, in those circumstances, um, one has to be um, as, I think, um, comfortable and uh, decisive as one can be, but at the same time, recognizing that there are, there are holes uh, in one's experience and uh, that, that um, you don't know everything. And of course, that's the most, important time to re rely on uh, platoon sergeants, squad leaders, and others, not only for their experience, but for your own education. To buy some competency time, you decided to take another course of baseball, something that was new, going towards these analytics. Uh, was that something you were keenly interested in, or did you see it as a way to compensate for what you didn't know about uh, old school baseball? You know, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, you know, we got involved in analytics in the early 80s. Um, and because I was just coming into baseball, uh, it was probably an easier form of player evaluation for, for me than, than uh, the more traditional approach, simply because I didn't have any experience in the traditional approach. But also, um, as it turned out, uh, the analytical approach led to results which were consistent with my own kind of intuitive 
um, understanding of the game. So in those days, um, there were kind of two approaches to the game. One was small ball and, uh, you know, bunt, uh, steal a base, hit a sacrifice fly, as opposed to big ball, which is get a couple of guys on base and hit a home run. And uh, honestly, I always felt that, hitting a home run with men on base was more entertaining than everything else. But it turns out that that's actually how to win games. Analytically, that's where it boils, that's how it boils down. Score as many runs as you can and give up as few as you can. And it doesn't matter how you do it, but ultimately the best way to score runs is to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Uh, so it's become, but being kind of a new guy, how tough was it to sell the old guard on this money ball concept? And it, was it more visionary on your part or the, uh, more of necessity. Well, <clears throat> I didn't try to sell other people on it. I believed in it. And um, at the same time, I was in a position to act on it without necessarily having to convince a bunch of other people. Uh, now, keep in mind, I didn't have a lot of credibility within the game. And so bringing in an analyst or professing to approach the game that way um, wasn't going to make me a lot of friends. But we actually hired an analyst. Um, we kept it quiet. We didn't advertise it. And, uh, um, you know, we, we began to adopt the, those uh, uh, concepts uh, very early on. But for the first few years, uh, I didn't really try to convince too many people that it was the right way to go. <laughs> but I will say one person I had tremendous success in, in uh uh, selling on the idea was Billy Bean, who was my assistant. And when I brought him in, the first thing I said was, go talk to so-and-so. He's our consultant analyst. And uh, Billy bought in hook, line, and sinker. And, of course, that led to Moneyball and a lot of other uh, changes in the game, frankly, over the last few years. How important is that for leadership in any sector, any business sector, being able to think out of the box and maybe – not do it the way it's always been done, but have the courage and the confidence to try something new. If you're a platoon commander, you're facing a different kind of situation probably every day in terms of whether it's tactical, whether it's uh, you know, physical, whether it's mental, whether it has to do with personnel, et cetera. There are these things that are constantly coming up. And I think that what the Marine Corps does is give you the opportunity to respond to changing circumstances. And that leads to, I think, ultimately, over a course of a career, a need to think outside the box in the sense that the box is always changing and uh and in order for uh you to be successful in an ever-changing environment you have to think differently from moment to moment situation to situation when you think of basic management skills everyone says well you got to have good people skills i know you probably encountered a wide variety of people while you were in the marine corps but you had some real characters the course of your baseball career that you had to deal with. And how were you able, did one size fit all, or did you have to accommodate the likes of uh, uh, Jose Canseco, Billy Martin, Raleigh Fingers, Reggie Jackson, and all these other characters that you worked with? Well, uh, no, one size does not fit all. Uh, although there's some, there's some commonality there. Um, when I first got in the game, Billy Martin was our manager in Oakland. And, for those who were old enough to remember Billy Martin, he was quite a character. And for the first few months that I was with Oakland, I was kind of in shock as to how he approached his leadership of the team. And he's probably one who I would say had a tremendous professional competence and virtually no personal qualities. <laughs> and as a consequence, you know, he was great uh, between the lines. He could, he, he was a great manager. And he was also very capable of, of uh, motivating players over a short period of time. But ultimately, his personality, his, um, his attitudes um, kind of overcame that initial credibility and respect and eroded. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, Billy didn't stay very long, very many places. I mean, he was the manager of the Yankees, I think, three or four times. So, uh, uh, but in any event, he, he um, and it took me several months to, to realize, no, this isn't just the way they do it in baseball. This is the way Billy Martin does it. And, um, 
so that was an interesting sort of first lesson in the game. The other, you know, the other big personalities, I think that you just have, a, have to have a sense of uh, who they are, uh, respect for them, respect uh, for what they've accomplished, but not compromising your own principles in terms of how you deal with, with people individually. My, my style is, all, I've always felt that my leadership style is sort of friendly but professional. You know, I, I want to be, I don't, I don't want to be buddy-buddy, but I want it to be a friendly environment. One of the things we learned in the military was never dress someone down in public, always do it in private. And I can remember an incident while I was doing sports here in the Bay Area when Billy went ballistic one night after a game and did substantial damage to the office <laughs> ballpark. And it never really made the news because you and Roy Eisenhart decided not to make it an issue and cleaned up the mess before anyone knew it had happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, we cleaned up the mess and we, we, we downplayed it publicly, but we never forgot what, uh, what that incident represented. And it wasn't too long thereafter that uh, Billy was on his way back to New York. You know, getting credit for good leadership often has a short memory. It's only, only as good as the last season or uh, the last report of earnings for a company or last election for a politician. Uh, taking over in 2010, the not so amazing Mets. Uh, did you think, or do we ever concern about your legacy that uh, this might be something that would uh, haunt your career as, a, as opposed to enhancing the career? Never really thought that way, Mike. Actually, I think as I look back on the time I've, I've been in baseball and even before, I've always enjoyed taking on the, the tough jobs the jobs nobody else wants uh, on the theory that, well, you know, I'll take a shot at it. Um, so I really haven't worried about results as much as process, if you will. Um, you know, baseball is about, is it over the last 30 or 40 years, as analytics have become more and more important. Uh, but this is true in terms of any uh, situation. It, it's not about 100% success. It's about enhancing the probability of success and making sure that you have done everything you can to ensure that you will be successful with, that, with, with the full understanding that there are some things that maybe are out of your control that will ultimately um, determine success or failure. But to simply say you either win or you lose is not really a good way to judge how how you've approached the situation. So, uh, you know, in these, these kinds of, in, in baseball at least, it's not true in the military and the Marine Corps. It's not like, okay, we're gonna, you know, focus on the process, but if we lose, you know, this battle, uh, it's okay <laughs> because we've enhanced our probabilities. Uh, entirely different environment. But in baseball and in, I think most business, that's what you're trying to achieve. Crisis management is always the ultimate leadership challenge and the current pandemic and the problems with racial inequality is testing every institution, including baseball. Uh, can the MLB, can the Major League Baseball get rise to the occasion here, find the leadership to uh, solve the impasse they're having about between the players and the owners to get the game back on the field? Very good question. I think the answer is yes. But uh, as you point out, we're, we're going through a period of social and economic upheaval. And I think on a social level, that upheaval will lead to changes that are long overdue in many, many aspects of our society here and, and perhaps around the world. At the same time, and to some extent separate from that, uh, we have this economic upheaval that has resulted from uh, a pandemic that um, you know, is a once, once a century kind of event. And I, I think that as a result of those two different threads, um, we're gonna see change over the next 10 years in this country. And so in terms of baseball and this, getting the season back together uh, and trying to play, I think it's mostly, you know, an economic uh, situation that has to be resolved. And unfortunately, um, I think both sides, the owners and the players, are trying to reconcile what changes need to be made and to what extent. 
uh, at a time when we're still in transition. Um, so uh, on the other hand, you know, I don't think this is a short-term issue that they need to be dealing with. I think this is kind of a zero-sum game over the next two or three years. There's only going to be so much money that the industry is going to generate. There's only going to be so much money that the owners are going to be willing to pay. There's only so much money that the players are going to be able to extract. And I think what the players don't get now, they will get over the next couple of years. Conversely, what the owners have to shell out now, they won't really – have to pay in the next couple of years, they'll be able to make adjustments. So I think ultimately what that means to me is get a deal done. You don't have to win. It can be a compromise and let's move on because we've got a lot of other issues we have to face over the next uh, two or three years. As an American institution, how baseball handles this crisis and leads its way through to some kind of a solution. Is that going to be symbolic you think for how the country is going to have to do the same in almost every capacity? Uh, I hope not, because the way MLB uh, is forced to address these issue is, issues is with a lot of contention. And um, I don't think there needs to be contention in every decision and change that we uh, um, see over the next five or 10 years. But, you know, baseball has to be careful because uh, perception is reality. And to the extent that, for example, just, just simply, if basketball and hockey come back before baseball with the NFL to follow in, Feb in uh, the fall, presumably, baseball is going to be an afterthought. People are not – it's important for baseball to get back first. Um, the NBA is coming back in playoffs. The NHL is coming back in playoffs. Baseball needs to get back so that it has the full attention of the country before everything else starts, uh, sports-wise, before everything else starts up. On a personal level, Sandy, what's brought you back into the leadership game now with the Oakland A's? You're 73, you were sidelined a bit because of a medical situation, but you're back in the game now. Is that part of the instinctive nature that leaders have of always wanting to be in the game? You know what? I think it's... I think it's the instinctive nature that teammates have. I, I just enjoy being around the people uh, who are in the game. The great thing about, I found with baseball over the years is that it's much like the military. It's much like the Marine Corps where you're exposed to people from various socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, ethnicities, levels of education, etc. And I enjoy the challenge that that represents. I enjoy hanging out with the equipment manager, Steve Boosin at Shit Oakland has been there 50 years. I just like hanging out in his office. I enjoy talking to the coaches, which is a very different conversation than talking to an owner or a lawyer. I find those things challenging and uh, invigorating. And, uh, and I, have a, I have an opinion. <laughs> I've been around long enough, so I have an opinion. I don't mind sharing it. Uh, my role in Oakland, I'm not a decision maker. I'm there, uh, you know, as, a, uh, as an advisor, but um, keeps me involved. And uh, that's why I've enjoyed the game. I enjoy the people. Sandy, thanks for sharing your leadership lessons learned and, and also for your continuing contributions to the Marine Memorial Club. You've been a very longtime supporter. We appreciate it. And uh, good luck in, in your current endeavors. All right. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. For more information on Leading from the Front and how you can support it and the Marines Memorial Association with your tax-deductible contribution during this challenging time, go to ourmission.marinesmemorial.org forward slash lead.